So first of all, I want to just kind of apologize to some of my viewers. Uh, some of you probably like this episode. Uh, I say that with some degree of certainty since this is among one of the more liked episodes uh, when I hear people talking about Star Trek in general, or Voyager in general, excuse me. And uh, it usually gets near the top 20 or 30-ish of most Voyager lists that I've looked at, so... Um, it is not that high for me. While it certainly has its high marks, and I think I understand why people like this episode so much, it kind of irritates me a little bit too much for me to actually really enjoy. And I'm going to try and describe why as we go through this. So this episode was a deliberate follow-up to the episode Learning Curve, which itself, and including this one, was also kind of a follow-up to Lower Decks. Now, this may sound weird, because I loved Lower Decks. It's actually among my favorite TNG episodes. I mean, it's not like the super best, but it's still in like the top 20 or so. Sound familiar? Uh, Learning Curve, I hate it. <laughs> if you'll remember, that was all the way back in Season 1 or 2. I think it was Season 2. Uh, and I just really walked all over that one and said, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. And that's still true. You know, my, my opinion on that has not changed. This one kind of is in the middle of the two for me. Because... What Lower Decks did so well was it was a normal, completely average Star Trek The Next Generation episode done from the perspective of the non-standard. So we got a completely fresh take on things without having to actually change up the formula. And uh, that actually was very creative and very well done and very well executed. They got some good you know, guest stars and all that fun stuff. And that. It worked out quite well. Um, there's actually another episode of TNG that did the same thing that most people don't really associate with Lower Decks. It's called uh, First Contact. Not the movie, the episode. And um, that's another example of a completely standard, everyday Star Trek episode from a different perspective. It, it worked out quite well. Um, and I liked that. And I felt like the biggest thing it did really well was the framing. It took the ordinary the things that we, the viewers, are completely accustomed to and portrayed it from an in-universe perspective for what normal people in-universe would see it as. And therefore, it looked more magnificent, more fantastical, more large-scale, more important, more dramatic, whatever term you want to use here, because we were seeing it from their perspective, through their viewpoint, through their eyes. And thus, we got to appreciate it again, right? I mean, it sounds incredibly cynical and bitter, but the reality is, for us, the real people, Star Trek... Space travel, alien races, threat of the week, that's old news. That's been old news for decades at this point. I mean, we're at the 50th anniversary, or... 50th? 40th? I don't remember. Uh, no, yeah, it's the 50th, it's the 50th. We're at the 50th anniversary of Star Trek this year, for God's sakes. <laughs> I, I, it's hard to keep track, because it's like the Metroid anniversary is this year, and then there's like a Sonic anniversary, and... Anyways, point being, anniversary, uh... But what learning curve did not do, what learning curve, what learning curve did not do, that uh, that lower decks did was learning curve was not actually about those lower crewmen. It was about Tuvok. That was a Tuvok episode. So we got the standard, except it also had this kind of we'll learn to work together kind of shoved in without ever actually trying to work towards it. And Tuvok, to be completely blunt, was an absolute dick towards the Maquis crewmen, not understanding or recognizing that they simply, that everyone does not learn the same way. And Tuvok's inability to acknowledge something that is very logical and basic was, I felt, a disservice to his character. So it wasn't good for Tuvok, it wasn't good for the guest stars, and it was a normal episode on top of, or I should say, underneath all of that. This episode, like I said, it's kind of an in-between. I think, just my opinion, the biggest reason why people love this episode is the guest stars. All three of them actually put in pretty damn good performances. Uh, I don't have the names of the actors written down, but uh, the woman who plays Ta uh, Tal Celis, 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 <laughs> the Bajoran, um, does an excellent job of someone who is inept and kind of resigned to that, but she doesn't come across as pathetic. She, she walks a tightrope there and doesn't actually fall over into the realm of, you know, just pedantic or whining or self-hating or anything like that. She's just very self-aware. 
Uh, Billy, of course, actually is one of my favorites. The actor who plays him did a, did a really, really good job in this. And he portrayed someone who, despite his issues, is portrayed very human throughout the course of the thing. In many ways, I feel like his character was inspired by Barkley. Uh, it, it, it's a similar general concept, but a different take on it with his hypochondria. Uh, and the fact that he wanted to... He actually wanted to interact with others. He actually was good with others. He actually was good at his job. It's just the fact that he has this one little glitch in his personality. Um, and he just comes across as kind of an everyman. So I think that was very successful. Even the gentleman who played Mortimer. Now that was an interesting one. Because, as I'll talk about later... Well, I guess I'll just talk about it now. There's no reason not to. He's a dick, right? The guy comes across as a dick. Now... Interest of fairness, interest of total honesty, total, you know, it's, you know, if I was just to interact, my first reaction would be, oh, screw off, dude. The moment I started thinking about it, though, and this is how I try to approach things in real life, I don't always succeed, of course, because I'm just as flawed as everyone, uh, except more so. I'm, like, double flawed. Uh, he's understandably a dick. This is someone who is afraid. He does a great portrayal of it. He never even says it outright, to my knowledge. I mean, there's the one scene where he acknowledges, you know, maybe a few seconds of real life will, will interact with me or whatever, but he never says outright, I'm afraid. He, and, and it's the best part because it's the best kind of fear. It's the fear you and I can understand. It's not the fear of getting killed. It's not the fear of a giant Tyrannosaurus Rex stomping down on you. I love using that example. It's a great example. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of trying. It's the fear of failing. It's a fear of all of the different random variables that come with interacting with real life. In theory, over here in the theory crafting realm, everything's clean. Everything's precise, and it's either right or it isn't. But if it's wrong, there's no consequence, is there? You just say, oh, I was wrong. I'll try again next time. And you go right back to it. In real life, you mess up, there's consequences. Little things can cause really big consequences. And Mortimer is definitely smart enough to recognize that truth and be terrified by it. How many of you have been afraid of the same thing in your lives? I know I have. Without shame, I admit it. So, on the one hand, it's like, God, he is just an ass. But on the other hand, it's so apparent how much of that is a mask that's built up over the last six years at least, but definitely over the last six years, of being in the Delta Quadrant, of just, I can't deal with this. Look at his position. He is, in the first shot we see of him, he is quite literally huddled in a hole, in a corner, just happy to be there and left alone with his theories. It's the only way he can deal with it. Think about that. And it's funny because even in that scene, he comes across as pretentious and, and a prude and, and a dick. Not prude, uh, a prat and a dick. And he's just, ah, but he's not really. He's just basically saying, go away. But he's gotten experienced at it. So instead of saying, go away, which never works. I mean, that never works. I mean, you, you know that. I know that. Instead, he insults you. He treats you as if you're pathetic, and he treats himself as if he's superior. And he knows that people react negatively to that, so they go away. It's, it's a surprisingly subtle touch, and indeed, like I said, the guest stars really nail the roles, and the chemistry between them is actually phenomenal. And that brings me to a big thing I wanted to talk about. We, we kind of discontinued the Lore Runner edition of these things, right? I mean, you know, we, we, we did a big vote on that. That was like in Season 2 or 3 or something like that. Um, but assuming I was doing the Page 1 rewrite type of rewrite, which is, in other words... I'm given this script, but you have to do something with this script. You can't just rewrite the whole series, which is what I'd want to do. Um, the page one rewrite of this, remove Janeway. I think that would be the critical component that helps flesh it out. Get Janeway off the Delta Flyer. Have her in the beginning, absolutely. Have her go down to interact with them, absolutely. I'll talk about that in a moment. Have her, you know, talk about how these people have slipped through the cracks and how she wants to take care of them. And, you know, this whole thing, you know, there's so much you can do with her character in that. Leave that in, put them on the mission, send them off. Now, here's the catch. Logically, in universe, sending three people who have never been on a away mission ever to a 72 hour mission in a shuttle is not a good idea from any perspective. I mean, just basic thinking, never mind tactical documents. So, 
Obviously, you need to have someone on the Delta Flyer with them. But how hard is it from a writing perspective to have that someone, whether it be Tuvok or Paris? Paris would be a good pick for this, by the way. Or Janeway herself or whoever, just, she's unconscious. Oh, God, that initial knocks and she flies into a wall and she's knocked into a coma. The end. No more need for the senior officer to interact. Still be a relevant part of the thing, after all. Because thanks to that character's presence now, escaping through the escape pods is not quite as viable as it would have been. So that actually adds more dramatic tension for them to try to save the flyer rather than to evacuate it. But, remove the character element of it. I honestly feel that Janeway's interactions with them were some of the worst parts of the episode. With one exception. When she's talking with uh, the Bajoran, <laughs> Celeste, uh, I keep wanting to say Celis because, you know, FF6, and that's how I've always pronounced Celis' name. Uh, when she's talking with the Bajoran, that actually is a good scene. It's got some great chemistry. It's got some good lines. It's surprisingly brutal and cynical for Voyager, and it's in such a subtle way that I feel like the editors didn't even notice it. Or whoever was in charge. Like, Rick Berman probably just, it completely didn't even occur to him what was being slid under the rug there. How many of you know what I'm talking about before I say it? I'm referring to the fact that she was voted in to Starfleet, made it through the Academy, even though she worked, so, she worked very hard, right? She did all that she could, she studied every night, and it wasn't good enough. Now, let's be clear, that's life. Sometimes that's how it works. And it sucks. It's discouraging, and it's disappointing, and God knows, people who have depressive issues in general, I'm talking about myself here, tend to take that kind of hard. I actually, there's so many things in my real life that I've wanted to do and wanted to do well, and, you know, I tried and I applied myself, and it didn't work. Did it? Now, theoretically, I could keep applying myself and eventually get good at that. That's the whole theory of the, the practice. I, I don't even remember what the proper name is, but, you know, the 10,000 hours thing. You really sh shove yourself into something, you will eventually become skilled at it, right? But, it's discouraging. When It's different when you don't try and you fail. When you try and you fail, now you're just, ugh. But she got in because she was a Bajoran. I can't believe they said that. That is so fitting, so appropriate, so accurate. It's one of the, it, it, it's strange to say, but that moment struck me more than any of the entire rest of the episode. That was just like, whoa, because that's exactly what would happen. It's not idealistic. It's not the romanticized Paradise Federation. It's the real Federation. The one who wants to help the Bajoran people. The one who has tons of sympathy for the Bajoran people. Remember what had been happening through DS9 over the course of the last several years leading up to this, right? I mean, DS9 had started by the time Voyager left. And she's, a, a, I think, a first year? They actually say it. I don't remember. But either way... The, the Federation had basically just retaken Deep Space Nine and just politically pushed the Cardassians out of Bajor right about the time this girl would have been going to the Academy and or finishing the Academy. Think about that. Think about being the token Bajoran. Think about what that would do to your morale. Because here's the thing. I mentioned earlier that if I kept trying, let, let's use singing, okay? I used to really want to be a good singer. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> it's really hard for me to sing, and I have breathing issues, so... And, and I can't even breathe properly through my nostrils because uh, of the, the cartilage that's wrong in there. So it's something that's even if I tried to apply myself at... And there's a couple of songs, like literally like three songs I can sing well. Despite that, I'm not a good singer. But if I kept applying myself thinking I'm going to make this with the proper attitude and the proper commitment, I probably could become a good singer. But what if someone said, oh, don't worry, we'll let you be a singer because you're an imperial or whatever, right? You know, something that's, you, you have no hair. Okay, there we go. You have no hair. You poor thing. Then my confidence is just shattered, isn't it? Now I'm not trying to be a better singer. Am I? Now I'm just accepting that I'm a bad one. And the only reason I was accepted into this singing job is because they took pity on me. You see how this is damaging? There's a difference between encouragement and pandering. And that's what happened to this poor girl. And it's, in my, like I said, in my opinion, it's the strongest moment of the whole episode. Let's rewind just a second here. One of the other things I want to mention... Uh, let, let's rewind a lot, actually. I've really skipped ahead of my notes. Um, so, the top-to-bottom shot at the beginning is brilliant. 
It's absolutely brilliant. I love it. Good directing, good effects, good overall style of the thing. It's literally how things would work. Again, this is a logical conclusion. It's how things would work on a starship. The captain gives an order. That order is handed off to uh, an officer. That officer hands it off to a crewman who hands it off to the next officer. That officer orders it down to an uh, to a crewman who's actually going to implement the change. Bam, bam, bam. Change implemented. We're good. And the path... This is a little bit too on the nose, admittedly. But the path quite literally, literally starts from the top of the ship, where Janeway is up in her quarters, or excuse me, her ready room, uh, all the way down to Deck 15 at the bottom of the ship, where he's, you know, Mr. Mortimer is huddled up, you know, in, in, his, uh, in his hull, the one who actually has to implement the order. Again, the, the, uh, the metaphor there is a little, little obvious, but it's still a brilliant shot and very well done, and I love that. Um... So, one other thing. This sounds like a weird nitpick, and I bet a lot of you are going to disagree with me on this. Why are people sharing bunks? We see that in the scenes with Billy and Celeste. They're actually sharing bunk beds. Now, I get that that's a thing in real life Navy ships. I get that only very, very few people get their own quarters in a, in a modern Navy vessel, and most of those people are the upper echelons of the officers. But Voyager is not exactly lacking for space, and nothing is indicating they're lacking for resources. Energy or being the big one, actually. Let's just stop there. Energy. Uh, so why exactly is it that they would need to bunk up like that? I know that sounds like just a strange thing, but it really bothered me. Like, if I was a crew... I, I've said so many times that life in Voyager would be basically a paradise. All that's thrown out the window if I have to share a bunk with someone. Now, granted, I have a hellacious time sleeping to begin with, but having to sleep with someone right above or below me, that doesn't... I, I might as well take pills every night. Doc, doc, yes, the doctor, yes, Mr. Picardo, uh, I need uh, six years of sleeping medication in order to sleep, because that's the only way that's going to happen. Anyways, um, let's, move, let's move on, let's move on. Um, Seven is really nitpicky and not understanding of you know, basic human concepts or anything in this episode. I'm starting to think that's the new joke. I bet some of you don't even remember what I mean when I say that. You remember back when Neelix is a bad cook? Isn't it funny? You remember that? I feel like this is the new that. That now it's all about Seven doesn't understand how people work. Isn't it funny? And it's going to get worse. We've are, And of course we have the whole Seven learns a lesson thing, which also is in this episode. I'm, I'm not even going to comment on it anymore. I'm just going to bring it up. Seven learns a lesson about humanity. Moving on. Um... What I want to talk about next is, because like I said, we've, we've rewound quite a bit here, is Janeway. Now, like I said, I would just eject her from the overall plot. But what's interesting to me is Janeway in this episode is portrayed as attempting the Picard style of command. Picard was, not counting season one, uh, Picard is much more of a fatherly, caring kind of a commander, right? He's, him and Riker actually share the same overall approach. Nowhere is this more apparent in Chains of Command. Great episode, by the way. Two episodes, I should say. Um, Picard is someone who clearly, demonstrably will interact with his crew in a way that shows that he cares about them and he will earn their trust. He will earn their respe respect. They will follow his orders because they choose to, not just because he happens to have a higher rank than them, right? Now, Janeway has always struck me as someone who is a much more distant kind of a leader. And I'm not criticizing that. It is a valid style of leadership. And I, was, I will talk about this when we get to Chains of Command, actually. Uh, Jellicoe's style of leadership is valid. And I think Janeway should have done more of that, to be completely honest about the series. But let's move on. What I feel like in this episode is they were trying to portray Janeway as if they were writing Picard. But then they realized that she wasn't Picard, and so it comes across as kind of awkward and kind of, meh. Here's the thing. I'm not necessarily opposed to that if it informs her character, if it's part of her character development. So here's what I mean by this. What if she tries this on-hands approach? What if she tries to be more motherly in her case, you know, more close to her crew? And in so doing, she actually ends up realizing that's just not her style. Now, see, here's the thing. Janeway is actually a fairly caring, personable kind of person. She's pretty, uh, actually fairly charismatic, I'd say. Let's go and use that word. It's easy to get along with her. Captain Janeway is very distant and very cold. 
And I feel like the dichotomy between those two is something that should have been explored more in this show. And this would have been a great time to really go into that. To have Janeway want to interact with her crew that she feels are not really being fulfilled on her ship, her home. But she has to go down there as Captain Janeway and it just doesn't work out right. And have her reflect on this and have her think about this. No, no changes in this episode. Let's not do one episode epiphanies like, like Harry Kim had. Let, let's actually do character arcs across multiple episodes. But you know, have this be like the beginnings of some new thought process for the way she functions as a commander. I think that would be a really cool way to do it. Just my thoughts. Um, uh, this is when I want to talk about something. I was originally going to start this episode about this. Uh, and I, just, I realized at this point, this, this is when it really comes together. Because she has this thing about how she wants to help, you know, the, these crew members to, to be awesome. Okay, right? She wants to connect with them. Now that's a valid thing. But let me, let's take a step away from the episode a moment and step into the writer's booth. Probably my biggest, second biggest flaw when it comes to writing. The biggest is motivation. My second biggest raw flaw when it comes to writing is intent versus reality. You want to write something that means, A, thematically, uh, character-wise, in terms of setting, you know, whatever, and you end up writing something, and when you reread it, it's actually B. This is a good episode, because it's clear by the, by the overall tone and approach of the episode that the intent here is she's trying to take care of her flock. But what actually comes across in the dialogue, in the acting, and in the overall presentation of the episode is she's trying to make these weirdos conform to the way things should be. Now, I shouldn't even have to explain why I'm against that. I'm not, I'm not going to go off on a big speech. I'm not going to go off on a rant. There's no need. It's, the argument speaks for itself. If we are so intolerant as to hate a man because he happens to carry the blood of a current enemy, direct quote, then maybe there's something wrong with us. That's not a direct quote. I don't remember the whole speech. <laughs> Picard's speech is hard to remember. The point is... One of the things I liked most, and this is why I wanted to rewind here, because I just talked about the scene with Celeste and uh, Janeway, is one of the best parts of that scene is the overall presentation, and Janeway herself gets it across. They never say it outright, but the implication is, you're different, referring to her, referring to Celeste, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with you not being some excelling computer science genius. There's nothing wrong with you not being a prodigy, prodigy. There's nothing wrong with you not even being comfortable with the kind of work you're doing. We can find something else for you. We can make this work. We can adapt to you because you being different is cool. Acceptance, tolerance, understanding, respect, all of that has to do with recognizing that other people are different, not making them the same, but accepting that they are different. That's probably the Star Trek ideal in one nutshell right there, that acceptance of difference, that acceptance of variance, in my opinion. And that's why that scene came together so well, because it was the only scene I felt in the whole thing that felt like it was actually the intent of the writing and the actual scenes that went out to page paper actually co you know, coincided. Everything else, it felt like Janeway was just trying to rope him back into the herd, you know? <laughs> just my opinion. I keep saying that. I, I, I have a feeling I'm going to get a lot of flack for this episode. I get defensive. What do you want from me? Um, I mentioned Billy has great chemistry with Celeste. Mortimer, I talked about him already. Janeway, I've actually kind of talked about her thing. I think I've kind of talked about all of this. I kind of went all over the place with this one. Um, oh yeah, one last note. See, I, I literally only have one more note to talk about. I get the need for the crisis in the episode. You know, oh my god, and this, and then we got to do this, and then we got to do this big explosion. Holy crap! I get the need for it. I do. They need to be challenged. Um, and of course, there's the whole there has to be a threat of the weak thing, which I admittedly disagree with. But ignoring my disagreement with that. I get the point of it here because they need to be challenged. They ne there needs to be something that contests them, that pushes them and forces them to move forward character-wise, right? But in this case, this might go back to that whole intent versus reality thing. Because I feel like that was the intent, but the reality instead feels like, oh shoot, we need to have a threat of the week. Quick! Staple, staple, staple. We're good. It literally feels like someone paper-clipped 
I'm mixing my metaphors here. Someone paper clipped a, another script of, oh gosh, threat, threat of the Week on top of the character development and interaction of the characters. And it doesn't feel like it flows with the, well, the two plots don't feel like they flow together. It really does feel, and that's the other thing, it feels like two plots, even though it should just be the one. This should be a singular plot episode, but it feels like there's two. Probably the biggest example of this is there's this great back and forth between Janeway and Mortimer. And she just finally drops all pretense of trying to be nice, basically, and says, don't you ever wonder, even for a microsecond, what it would be like to have friends and interact with others? And Mortimer's face speaks volumes. And he looks at her and he says, you don't understand me. And she says, well, that's kind of the point of this whole endeavor. And then it feels like someone hits the, this is just my impression, it felt like someone hit the pause button on that plot. And all the, and like within a couple of seconds of that conversation, there's like this, there's, okay, there's a couple of seconds of silence. And then, oh my God, we got to deal with the crisis again. <laughs> It felt like it just got interrupted by the stapler. I'm really mixing my metaphors. That's all I got. I still think this is a good episode. I just don't, don't think it's a great episode. And there's some great moments in it. And, oh my god, she's a Bajoran. <laughs> I'll see you next time, guys.